All right, welcome to another edition of Soapbox Sunday here at Blue Glow Electronics. It is 127-2019. I just want to say sorry for the slowdown in my content um, over the last week or so, and I imagine the next few weeks will be similar. Um, just over a little over a week ago, I lost my mother to a, um, a many-year battle with Alzheimer's, and uh, I know as sad as that is, um, you know, she's in a better place at this point in time. So at um, any rate, I imagine that'll be impacting my personal life some, just having to deal with various things there. Um, but we'll be back as we can, and we'll kind of keep these things trickling in. All right, let's jump on into topic number one. All right, I've had a few people comment to me uh, recently that they're having, they can't see the comments in my videos. And... Um, I personally have no idea what's causing that, but I thought I would bring it up here so in case any of you guys uh, might have a solution for them, you could post it down below in the comments that they can't see. But if I notice it down there, I'll call it out in the next video. Uh, more of a shout out just to see if anybody knows how to fix that. All right, guys, I'm still trying to get this stuff worked out with my uh, recording, uh, both face and screen and and good resolution and whatnot. And I've um, been playing around with a piece of software called OBS that's promising. Haven't got, quite got it tweaked yet. As a matter of fact, I think it made my last video on uh, how to install an LED halo light uh, really small at the 360. So I, I'm still tweaking with it. We will figure it out. And uh, and uh, But I think we've uh, got some settings now that are at least halfway working here in Camtasia. Okay, a viewer of mine this past week said, hey, Mark, could you possibly fix your cursor? It's so small um, when you're showing schematics and whatnot. So I went into Windows 10, and I've made the cursor as big and as bold as it will let me do. So uh, give me some feedback on this, and uh, hopefully this will help um, going forward. Hopefully you can see my cursor much easier moving around on the screen now. But another viewer actually sent me a link to this and said, hey, here are some... Uh, they you know, supposed non-inductor, but if you read here, it says they have a slight amount of inductance, probably not enough to matter at audio frequencies. But these are 50 watt, 8 ohm Milwaukee resistors, and if you put them with a heat sink, uh, you know, use some heat sink grease, and, and attach them to something that'll dissipate the heat, um, you can use them as 100 watts. You could put two of these in parallel, two of them in series, to kind of get you a 200 watt, 8 ohm scenario here. Uh, matter of fact, Pete Millett uh, made a post using some of these recently, so I just thought I'd point it out to you guys. It may be a much cheaper alternative than uh, some of the really expensive ones out there right now. These things are coming in at a whole $5 uh, each and $4.50 if you buy 10 of them. All right, I recently got a question into my AskMark inbox, and it was basically, hey, Mark, could I just put another tube in parallel with the output tube in an amplifier of mine and double the output power? Well, um, in theory, um, potentially, um, but I can tell you that uh, there, there may be a good bit of redesign that you have to go through to do that. Back in uh, my RF days, I used to do a lot of RF amplifier work back in the 80s and 90s, and um, those, it, you, you saw that quite frequently. You would parallel several output tubes. But the beauty of that was you had a Pi network typically on the input of those and on the output, and you could kind of just adjust that and then just drive them a little bit harder on the input. It wasn't that big a deal. It's not so simple with an audio amplifier. One, um, you're not using a Pi network to match the uh, output impedance to a transmission line. You've got an output transformer there, and typically um, the load of two tubes in parallel, that cuts your uh, output uh, impedance in half. So you'd have to have a new output transformer um, rated at half the output impedance of, uh, of a uh, single tube. Um, then you got to worry about the Miller capacitance in these tubes. Uh, it gets really hard. It gets harder to drive a tube when you've got this. Remember when you put two tubes in parallel, you're basically putting capacitors in parallel, par capacitors in parallel double. So you got more capacitance there to deal with. You've also got to consider the grid leak resistor a little bit um, and, and how that affects uh, how hard it is to drive the, uh, the amplifier stage as well as the power supply. Your power supply may not be capable of providing the current needed um, through an additional set of output tubes. So you kind of got to look at the 
of the unit as a whole and kind of um, maybe step back to some of the design elements and relook at it. But um, if done properly, it can be an amazing thing. So don't steer away from it. Just make sure you take all aspects into consideration. There's a good bit of articles out online about it. You could uh, do more reading. Maybe one day when I've got spare time, when I retire, we can make a whole video on it or something. All right, I get a lot of questions from you guys and gals in my inbox, and a lot of them are speaker related. Hey, how would you change this crossover? Um, where could I get parts at for this? Um, what about reconing this? Would you change that? Um, so I get a lot of speaker questions, and I've, I've only ever made one or two speaker videos. And um, so a good friend of mine, uh, Skip Wakefield uh, in Winston-Salem here, he always has this saying, you know, uh, kind of know your swim lane. And, um, and if you get outside of your swim lane, be careful. Um, and if you plan to get outside of your swim lane, kind of be intentional about learning another swim lane. And uh, that kind of applies to speakers for me. I mean, I understand them conceptually, but I've never been a guy that has restored or, or built or tweaked or designed speakers. Um, you know, usually if I need something reconed, I find somebody to do that for me. I need my crossovers rebuilt. I can typically do that myself, but, um, I'm no speaker expert, to be honest with you guys. So I just wanted you to know that. And, uh, you know, you can still send me questions if you want, but you'll still probably get the answers of, uh, Hey, that might be a little bit out of my swim lane and, uh, it's not my, not my total area of expertise there. So um, there's probably probably better places to post your question, uh, some forums online than my, than my inbox as it relates to speakers. So uh, keep that in mind though about your swim lane uh, and uh, be good at what you're good at and uh, be willing to admit when you're not. All right, I got this question recently. It's basically said, hey Mark, I've seen you wire up a couple amps now using uh, AC heater wiring. You know, when do you need to use DC heater wiring, okay? And the answer to that is it kind of depends, all right? So first and foremost, in an output amplifier, it's probably not that big a deal, and you probably will always be able to get away with just AC heater wiring, okay? Where the DC heater wiring comes into play is in a preamp, okay? Phono stage where you're dealing with super small signals, you know, five millivolts, um, whatnot coming off of your uh, turntable cartridge. Uh, maybe the first stage of amplification in a, uh, you know, line level amp, uh, preamp, whatnot. Um, so I would tend to lean more towards um, DC heaters in a preamp or a phono amp than I would in an output amplifier. And it really just comes down to, you know, how much noise might be induced by those AC heaters, which is typically fairly small. But how is that in relation to the signal you're actually dealing with? And so if the AC heaters are causing, you know, a, a signal in some more proportion to the one you're trying to amplify, of course it's going to... Uh, to come into play, but something like an output amplifier where your signal is huge and your AC <laughs> heater hum is teeny, um, probably not so. So just, just something to think about if you're designing uh, phono stages or uh, really sensitive preamps, uh, you might want to consider DC heaters at that point. And an output amplifier where you're feeding in with line level, uh, you know, volt and a half or volt, and then you're uh, amplifying that through, uh, probably not playing that big a deal. So I'm making my video and I hear this snoring sound and I'm trying to figure out what it is and uh, look over and on my couch is uh, my little weenie dog waffles. We uh, everybody every weekend we take, we'll jump on the four wheeler, I'll take them and our two Aussies and we go for a long run. Um, probably a mile or three, um, and they kind of follow along. We go down to the creek and play, let them play around in the water for a while, and then we come back to the house and uh, usually wears them out. But uh, this is my daughter's dog that uh, she got uh, about six weeks before she went away to college, which if you know what that means, this is uh, my dog. All right, you may remember about a year ago, I did a restoration or some repair on a uh, Sherwood S5500 Mark III, and when I sent it back to the individual, it was looking looking great, working great. 
And the individual, I told him if you know if you ever wanted to get rid of this, I'd love to have it in my collection because it was a it was a, just a beautiful unit. Uh, except for it didn't have a top cover because it had came out of a console unit. And um, somewhere along the way, the gentleman uh, found a uh, top cover for it. But here recently, over the holidays, he reached sent me a text and said, "Hey, Mark, I'm thinking about uh, cleaning out some gear and." Uh, I think I'm going to part with that Sherwood if you have any interest. So I, I drove up and met him off the interstate and, uh, and bought this thing. So I'm glad I did. I got it. And um, the top cover for it, while all original, um, you know, left a little bit to be desired. So um, kind of got to looking at the, the uh, black and copper uh, hammer tone from the uh, single-ended 807 amplifier. And I thought, wow, that would look good on this chassis. So I dropped it off with my powder coating buddy up the road here. He uh, paid, Next time he did a run of that uh, hammer tone, he coated it and sent it back to me. And I just thought I'd show you the pictures of it. I think it's amazing looking. I'm going to file this thing away now in my uh, personal collection. All right, just a quick update. I've, I've continued to use this analog discovery software and my new dummy lid setup. Things are working absolutely phenomenal. Um, I just, with, with my mom passing away, I've just not had time because I've got to redraw the diagrams and I probably need to sit down for a couple hours and do that. It's just not worked out. So stay tuned somewhere in the next, I, I don't know, maybe month now. I want to push it out a little bit, but I will get back around to this and I promise it'll be worth the wait. All right, holding true to our new tradition of a tech tip every video, I've got some items here that I use all the time on my bench, but honestly, in thinking about it, I've probably never shown them to you guys. And the reason being is I use them when I'm doing what I would call iterative type work, where I'm tweaking, tuning, trying to improve something, and I don't often make a video of that, so I don't know that you've ever seen them. But what I'm talking about here is a pair of decade boxes, okay? These are made by Cornell Doubler. One is a resistor decade box here, and one is a capacitor decade box. This resistor box is um, two, rated at 2 watts, and it will go from 0 ohms all the way up to 1 mega ohm. And it, this capacitor box, is, uh, both of these are rated at 600 volts. The capacitor box here will go from uh, 0 ohms up uh, 0 microfarads up to 0 0.01 microfarad. And what these things are absolutely great for is um, tuning feedback circuits. So, you know, a lot of your feedback circuits will be a little resistor with a little capacitor in parallel with it. Uh, also use them for uh, tuning, um, use this and re the resistor one in place of the cathode load resistor. So you can sit here and change the uh, load resistor and watch the current change through the tube, watch the overall dynamics of the circuit and or output and see what it's changing. I've got some larger units made by General Radio that are much larger than these that will handle a whole lot more current that I use sometimes on, on larger circuits. But um, I keep both of these under my bench and I use them all the time. Honestly, I picked both of these up at a ham fest probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and I paid $5 a piece for them. Um, this one had one of the broken banana jack, one of the banana jacks was broken, and I replaced it with just some Teflon jacks there for about $2, but um, I use these things all the time. You can find um, nice sets on eBay. Um, you don't have to spend a fortune on these, and uh, they're just great bench items. I highly recommend a set if you, uh, if you do much tweaking with uh, preamps or amplifiers or any electronics as, uh, as, uh, as far as that goes. All right, I just want to let you know, next weekend is Frost Fest, which is a uh, pretty considerable size ham fest in Richmond, Virginia at the uh, Richmond uh, International Raceway, I think it's called, there at the Speedway. Any rate, it's a pretty good ham fest. I usually go to it every year. I did not make it last year for some reason. I can't remember what, but um, I'll be headed up Friday afternoon. I'll probably get there around 3.30, hang out that evening with the people that are unloading. It's not open to the public on Friday. It's for dealer set up on Friday. Um, but uh, hopefully I'm going to meet up with Dennis Head and uh, some other friends of mine there, hang out Friday evening. Um, and then Saturday I'll be around probably until noon. Um, so if you happen to be in the Richmond, Virginia area and make the ham fest, um, I'm six foot four. It's not hard to miss me. I'm usually one of the taller guys in the place. So just uh, say hey and come uh, shake my hand and we'll uh, 
we'll talk audio or something. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to buy up all the good stuff, and I'll show you a video here of, of it in a week or two. <laughs> Just kidding. But hopefully I'll get to see some, some of you guys out there. All right, I got home from work late Wednesday night. Um, I just got done eating, came down, sat down at the PC here, probably about 8 o'clock, and started uh, searching online. Went through my traditional barter town on Audio Karma. I was scrolling through some Facebook groups, and lo and behold, boom, up pops this set of Fisher gear that I would really love to have. And anytime I see something like that, always the first thing I do then is I look at what city it's located in. And it's always hours and hours and hours, like it's Seattle, Washington, you know, all the way across country from me or something, you know, and I'm like, dang it, I'd love to buy that. There's just no way I can get it, you know, and, and you don't want to ship this kind of stuff typically. Um, but this one I looked and it said Salisbury, North Carolina, which I, I, I used to live in Salisbury. It's only 40 minutes up the road from me. And I thought, holy cow, that's uh, that's close. So I messaged the guy. I said, hey, I'm really interested in that one piece there you've got. And he kind of responded back and said, nope, I'm, I'm selling it all or I'm selling none of it. So, um, you know, less than an hour later, I'm at the guy's front door and uh, we, we kind of struck a deal uh, at the end of the day. And I walked away with, uh, with this stuff. And so I'm super happy. The main reason I wanted it is I have worked on a lot of Fisher gear over the years. And I, you just don't see this gear this clean. Take a look at this 300B. There's there's not, like not hardly a scratch on it. These things are always scratched up. The cases are always dented and dinged, and that's not the case with these. So um, I've got them home. Uh, pick these up. I got a set of a pair of 4311 speakers. I got a console unit, some other speakers, a reel to reel unit. It was it was a bunch of stuff in the lot. Um, but the main things I were at, was after here was the. Uh, the Fisher 400 CX2, those things, I used to see them. I used to pick them up for four, five, six hundred dollars. And those days are long gone. These things are up, up around the three grand price range now. And this absolutely beautiful SA300B, they're just uh, about impossible to find in good shape as well. So um, I'm going to be doing some, uh, I'll probably have to go through these, make sure everything's in line, uh, do whatever restorations needed. Uh, but then I thought I would do uh, some gear reviews on these things because a lot of people put this uh, 400 CX2 up there as in the peta, you know, pinnacle with the uh, Marant 7, the uh, ARSP3, the Macintosh MX110Z um, up in up in that upper echelon. So uh, we'll we'll see. Um, stay tuned. I'm excited about it, and uh, I'll share it with you guys as we go through it. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, stay tuned. We will get some more videos coming soon. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to try to sneak off to the Richmond Frost Fest uh, next weekend. And um, if so, maybe I can uh, talk uh, Dennis Had there into a little uh, ad hoc uh, impromptu interview or something. Who knows? Um, and put it on. Uh, put it up here for you guys. Uh, otherwise, I'll just make some video of the ham fest itself. Um, so stay tuned, and uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks for watching, everybody.